Hello everybody, Politiekman here. Burger is out for a while, so he asked me to fill in for him. So let's do that by continuing this channel's proud tradition of debunking Mr. Layman. Recently, Dr. Lehman concluded his miniseries on behavior and decision making with a video about the dystopia that will be brought about by filter bubbles. In this video, I'm going to refute some of his claims. In part 2, which will be uploaded to my channel at the same time as this video, I'm going to expand on this by addressing the filtering done by people themselves. It's weird that I even have to say this, but obviously none of this is meant to be mean-spirited, but rather a good faith effort to contribute to the conversation. Having said that, let's take a look at the claims made by Dr. Lehman. If you were to go to your Facebook, Twitter, or even your YouTube feed right now, if you have any of those that is, what would you find? A good mix of all sorts of people, opinions, news and ideas, or the complete opposite, mostly people, news and ideas that agree with you. So Probably the first. According to a Pew study from 2016, the political environment on social media, many, if not most, Facebook and Twitter users follow a mix of people with a variety of political beliefs. In fact, when comparing ideological segregation online and offline, as Gensko and Shapiro did in 2010, we find that there is very little ideological segregation online in regards to news consumption. Although they did find online news consumption to be somewhat more ideologically segregated than news consumption through broadcast television, it was less ideologically segregated than national newspapers and also less ideologically segregated than face-to-face -face interaction among peers. The researchers also found that the largest four sites, Yahoo News, AOL News, MSNBC and CNN, account for more than 50% of all visits, and those are all relatively moderate, with conservative shares close to the overall average among internet viewers. Also, according to Flexman et al. 2016, social media and search engines contribute slightly to ideological segregation, but only slightly. They also found that these channels are associated with an increase in the individual's exposure to opposing views. Furthermore, these researchers found that the vast majority of online news consumption is not accessed through search engines or social media, but by people accessing their favorite sites directly. Hence, not only do social media networks generally provide a better mix of different opinions than offline interactions or national newspapers, their share in online news dissemination is actually fairly limited. Interestingly, two papers by Conover et al. from 2011 and 2012 indicate that political polarization was quite evident on Twitter. Twitter didn't use an algorithm back then, and in fact didn't even have recommended tweets at the time. Hence, the political polarization on Twitter at that time was the result of actions taken by users, and not due to any sort of algorithmic filter bubble. We'll discuss more on this in the other video. On first glance, it seems rather harmless. If search engines or social media platforms do a bit of filtering for you, they are just improving your experience, right? What bad can possibly come of that? Although the monopolies held by Facebook and Google in particular are potentially dangerous, there is no evidence to support the notion that it is currently causing significant issues. This might also be why Dr. Lehman chose not to provide any serious citations for his points around filter bubbles, while he did provide citations to support his argument about filtering by the users themselves. The only source Lehman cited in relation to filter bubbles is Eli Pariser, but he relies mostly on anecdotal evidence and pop psychology. Also, Eli is a political activist, not a scientist. The man has an agenda, and to portray his political opponents as simply stuck in a filter bubble would be an effective strategy to delegitimize their position. I'm not saying Eli is certainly being dishonest, but it's important to keep in mind he has potentially conflicting interests. There was also the study done by Haim et al. in 2017, where the researchers cultivated four different accounts to see if there would be a difference in articles found in Google News. They only found minor differences, and those differences didn't really manifest themselves in the first couple of pages of results. Although there did seem to be some overall bias on Google's part in favor of certain news outlets, there was no clear indication as to why this was occurring. There was no evidence of ideological preference by Google, and a technical or SEO-related reason seems to be the most likely. This is not to say that a company like Google, which runs the two biggest search engines on the planet, couldn't abuse its power. However, there is no evidence to support the notion they currently are. Then again, Google is for plebs anyway. I recommend DuckDuckGo, which does not personalize your results at all. The younger generations are increasingly moving away from television and towards online media. This puts websites like Facebook, Twitter and YouTube in an incredibly strong position of power. Well, that's correct. Younger generations do use online media. 
However, if the online media filter bubble feeds polarization, we would expect the youth as its prime users to also be the most polarized. That is, however, not what the data shows. Boxall et al. 2017 showed that polarization between 1996 and 2012 happened primarily among the people who spent the least amount of time online, and polarization among youths and young adults had increased far less than polarization among the elderly. This indicates the internet might not have the effect the filter bubble hypothesis says it should have. Interesting side note, I have seen a lot of people claim Facebook and or Twitter helped Trump win the White House, but as a study by Pew Research found, voters in the 2016 presidential election mostly got their news from Fox or CNN, with only 8% of voters using Facebook as a main news source. Breitbart, Twitter or other non-mainstream online news sources don't even make the top 10. Ask yourself, how often do you get a suggestion for a video that you disagree with, or a news article you won't like? And how often do you get suggestions for content that you do like? Well, the algorithm isn't about showing you things you like or agree with. The algorithm is about showing you whatever you're most likely to click on, because that's what brings in the money. If you consistently click only on extremist sources, you will be somewhat more likely to see extremist content. But even then, the effect of the filtering appears to be fairly marginal. If you actively seek out opposing views, you are somewhat more likely to be presented with sad views. The algorithm is based on user behavior, not the other way around. The initial idea of filter bubbles focused almost entirely on how algorithms make decisions for us without our knowledge or consent. But that's only part of the story. The truth is that on top of this provided science filtering that actually may not even be that important or strong, the users do filtering on their own, and a lot of it. Well, as noted, the algorithmic filter bubble is fairly irrelevant. Filtering by the users is very relevant, and the next part of Lehman's video deals with filtering done by the end users themselves. This is the topic of part 2 of this video, so I'm not going to delve into that here. For now we're going to skip ahead to where Lehman brings up gatekeeping theory. Above all of this, however, is one more level of filtering. Gatekeeping. Imagine a wall with a gate in the middle. On the one side you have unlimited information. Wars, terror, stock market, celebrities, food, science, healthcare, you name it, it's there. On the other side you have the public. And in the gatehouse you have, depending on context, a journalist, a news station, or by now, just a lucky user. And they decide what information will be picked up and presented as a news story. News then are selected under a large number of criteria, but often highly dependent on what media outlet is doing the selection. A tabloid is probably Probably looking for profit and controversy, while an independent journalist may be looking for the public good and what he perceives to be the truth. However, for this video it's completely irrelevant who does what kind of selection and when. I disagree, it's not irrelevant who does the filtering, or rather it is relevant how many people do the filtering. You see, with the advent of the internet and independent media, the amount of gatekeepers has been raised to an effectively unlimited number. More gatekeepers means more diverse access to news, which fits with our earlier findings that online media offers more different perspectives than offline media. Sure, we could consider Facebook and Google to be gatekeepers, and with their current attempts at curtailing spam, clickbait and evil fake news, there is something to be said for this theory. However, with the sheer number of gatekeepers around these days and the many ways to find them, there is really no reason to assume the situation is worse now than it was 20 or 30 years ago, when virtually all we had was mainstream and local media. As I've said before, Google and Facebook most certainly have the potential to become harmful gatekeepers, but they currently aren't, and frankly I don't expect them to become that either. The goal of these companies is simple, to make money. They make money by having people use their platforms as much as possible. The way to make people stay around on their platform is by making sure people enjoy themselves. We've already touched on this a little bit here, and I'll go deeper into it in the other video, but people are really quite adamant about the content they consume, and political content especially so. If Facebook or Google were to bombard people with political or ideological content they disagree with, it appears unlikely that this will lead people to actually change their mind, but it is more likely to drive people away from the platform. So to wrap up, filter bubbles are a massively overstated threat. There is very little research to support the notion that filter bubbles have a significant effect. Even the studies that do find some effect only ever come up with the tiniest of effects, which are dwarfed by filtering in national newspapers or in social circles. The threat of censorship by information monopoly holders like Google and Facebook is present, but unlikely to come to real fruition anytime soon, because there is no economic incentive for these companies to actively censor or promote certain ideologies. 
They of course play a PR game by publicly supporting whatever ideology is popular at any given time, but that doesn't mean they will incorporate this ideology into their actual product, and even if they did, there is no evidence to support the notion that that will actually have any significant effect. So filter bubbles aren't the problem, the problem is people. And to explore why that is, head over to my channel where we're going to take a look at how people limit their own exposure to conflicting viewpoints. We'll also find out which type of discrimination is more prevalent, racism or political discrimination. For now I'm Politikman, thank you for watching and I will hopefully see you all again soon.